Good afternoon. My name is Nicholas O'Rourke. I am the state organizing director for the Pennsylvania Working Families Party, small church pastor of the Living Water United Church of Christ in Oxford Circle here in Philadelphia, as well as the co-chair for the Faith Leaders Caucus of Power, Pennsylvanians organized to witness, empower, and rebuild. Today's a very important day across this country and especially here in Philadelphia, not just for the reasons that we have gathered, but also for the heartbreak that we have all endured in the last 24 hours. Let us all pause for a moment of silence for those lives that were lost in the Fairmount Row House yesterday. May their memories be for a blessing. I want to begin by saying that um, given the nature of this current political moment uh, and all those who have gathered here today, I am going to make sure that I lift up a couple of names that I think are important to lift up in the cause of defending democracy. I'm particularly grateful to representatives, State Representative Malcolm Kenyatta, as well as State Representative Rick Krajewski, for acknowledging the urgent need to get in the fight we are all gathered here for early last year. And to all those names that I don't have time to call or name that have been working, let me say and say with all of us, thank you, thank you, thank you. It has been a personal concern of mine for some time that those of us concerned with the protection of democracy have been so preoccupied by other important issues facing its erosion that our collective sight may have been diverted in that we are taking for granted our hard fought right to vote, a right particularly precious to black Americans. Let's be clear, we are seeing both a continuing and a renewed all out assault on the vote in America. Though many of us have grown up here in the oldest democracy in the world, it might assume so, democracy in fact is not a given. It is not a naturally occurring phenomenon or some permanently fixed astronomical cycle that we can bet on its regularity. At any given moment, at any given time, any democracy on the planet, including ours, is becoming more or becoming less democratic. And those of us concerned with its preservation would do well to pay attention to which direction our democracy is trending. Not only because the rest of the world, to varying degrees that is, really does pay attention to what happens in the United States and may follow its trends. But in an annual survey known as the Democracy Perception Index, for example, people around the world were asked about, quote unquote, threats to democracy amidst the rise of right-wing populism. And among the list of threats, 44% of respondents said that a threat to democracy is the United States itself. But we would do well to pay attention to these trends because they impact those of us who actually live here in the United States. And our observations at the Working Families Party, and I'm sure other organizations as well, conclude that we are trending in the wrong direction. Yes, even the record-breaking turnout numbers in the 2020 presidential election of President Biden and Vice President Harris did not slow the trend towards the erosion of democracy. And by consequence, its most important component, the vote, the ballot. Even a week-long block party outside the convention center to protect the ballot in 2020 may have secured the election of a duly elected president, but it did not slow the trend towards the erosion of democracy. Even winning a razor-thin quote-unquote majority in the United States Senate, thanks to Georgia, has not s stopped the trend toward the erosion of democracy. And that erosive force is not without a name. Let's be clear. We must always call it what it is. For some time, it has been clear to the Republican Party 
that high voter turnout is bad for their election prospects and thusly their power. Following that logic, it is also clear to them that voter turnout being low is good for them and the promise of their minority rule. As a consequence, over the last decade, the Republican Party has been claiming, falsely of course, that voter fraud is a major problem in states all across the union in order to help drive their push to decrease voter turnout that ensures their political viability. Unfounded claims that the deceased are voting have been echoed from the chambers in states like Missouri and Michigan and Wisconsin, to name a few. And though the evidence for such is all but non-existent, it has allowed Republican-led legislatures in these states to roll out and pass laws that make voting rights more restrictive where they are to help ensure their goal of consolidating power. Take, for example, the state of Wisconsin and its voter ID laws. Similar to Pennsylvania in its importance to the wielding of national power, Wisconsin in 2016 saw 9% of its electorate did not have voter IDs that adhered to their strict voter ID laws. A study from Priorities USA showed that the Wisconsin voter ID laws reduced, reduced voter turnout by 200,000 votes and disproportionately affected black voters, of course, and Democrats. Meaning 200,000 people could not vote because of intentional voter ID laws passed by the legislature there. Take this into account when one recalls that Donald Trump won Wisconsin by only 22,748 votes. It should be no surprise then that almost weekly, Donald Trump crisscrossing across the country campaigning right now, still the clear leader of the Republican Party, says at rallies in North Carolina and all over, I've heard him say it multiple times, that if federal voting rights legislation passes, quote, there will never be another fair election in our country. Elected officials who serve in the state legislature, legislative chambers, who idealize the former president, are in typical fashion looking to champion his cause all over the US and to whatever degree they can under a democratic governor here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania as well. Three of which here in PA, some of you may know their names, spent time last year in Arizona studying the continued movement there to overturn the votes in the 2020 general election and bring those tactics back to our commonwealth. But these habits did not begin with Trump. Some of you may recall when the former Republican Pennsylvania House Speaker, Representative Mike Terzai, said before the 2012 presidential election, and I quote, voter ID, which is going to allow Governor Romney to win the state of Pennsylvania, done, end quote. A real Republican sitting president pushed the overthrow of a free and fair election in real time last year and again now as he hasn't stopped pushing it. Even in the aftermath of the infrastructure during the activities, uh, uh, excuse me, at the aftermath of the insurrection during the activities on this day one year ago, 146 Republican congresspersons still voted to overturn the election results. In the words of Congresswoman from Missouri, Pastor and Representative Cori Bush, the official platform of the Republican Party is to take away people's right to vote. Anti-black voter suppression dates back to reconstruction with things like poll taxes and literacy tests. The 1965 Voting Rights Act finally resulted in an end to many of these things. However, the Supreme Court decision in the Shelby County versus Holder case of 2013, led by Bush-appointed Chief Justice Johnny John Roberts, has gutted that law and caused what we are seeing in this renewed push to suppress the vote. Arguing in the 5-4 decision that the Voting Rights Act no longer was necessary because the rampant racism that had required the act was no longer active in the United States. That the law was essentially calcified. That decision has cleared the path for the pushes that we've seen across this nation and right here in this commonwealth to make it legal or illegal to even receive water while standing in the line to exercise one's right to vote. Let me wrap this up. Whether it be pushing strict voter ID laws in Wisconsin or claiming voter fraud in Missouri, calling for never-ending recounts in Arizona, 
forcing returning citizens to pay debts before they receive their rights to vote in Florida, demonizing mail-in ballots here in Pennsylvania, the assault on the vote, which is so precious to black Americans and all Americans, who, though having built the material grandeur of this country, were built into the design of this country for the purpose of extraction and disempowerment, is a very real threat that must be stopped with a pro-democracy movement that pulls all of us together in its defense. Kurt Chachalski once said, a country is not just what it does, it's also what it tolerates. And the Working Families Party looks forward to continuing our efforts to fight unmasked white supremacy and unregulated Christian nationalism. And I invite every organization in this room represented today to redouble your current efforts well before Election Day. In black and brown low-income neighborhoods, connecting people directly to the services that were realized because of the last cycle, and engaging with them about upcoming elections and what's at stake, and to do that right now. We all have to be tired of hearing our folks tell us we never come around until we want something. So let's not do that. We need to pass the Freedom to Vote Act and John Lewis Voting Rights Act federally now, yesterday, and protect the right to vote here in our commonwealth. I'll conclude with this. When voters, when people of color, when low-income black and brown communities, when faith and justice organizations, when election workers who work our polls are under attack, answer me this question. What do we do? We stand up and fight back. What do we do? We stand up and fight back. Thank you. And that, that having been said, we would like to receive now to hear from one of our sitting congresspersons catching the brunt of all the chaos that's happening in the United States Congress. An American attorney and politician, she's a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, representing Pennsylvania's fifth congressional district since being sworn into office on the 3rd of January 2019. Let's put our hands together and receive at this time Congresswoman Mary Gay Scanlon. Thank you so much and good afternoon, everyone. Mary Gay Scanlon, currently uh, representing Pennsylvania's 5th Congressional District, but a lifelong civics advocate. So I am delighted to be here today at the National Constitution Center, which is so dedicated to helping Americans understand the importance of civics in our country. One year ago today, I was sitting in my office in DC across the street from the Capitol preparing to defend Pennsylvania's electoral college votes from the lie that was being told by the former president, by his allies, in their attempt to overturn the 2020 election. Those votes had been certified by our state, and the same ballots that had caused, um, the same ballots that had elected President Biden for our state were the same ballots that our colleagues in Congress had been sworn into Congress on just three days before, yet we knew they were waiting to challenge the very same ballots that had caused them to be sworn in. So at this time, 12, 12.30, I was in my office preparing our defense of Pennsylvania's voters, our defense of Pennsylvania's electoral college votes. But as the afternoon wore on, as we got to one o'clock and two o'clock, the Capitol complex started to be evacuated. Different buildings were evacuated and locked down. I started fielding concerned calls and texts and Facebook messages and LinkedIn messages, every form of communication that we had from family and friends and staff while I was getting lockdown tips from a friend who's a school teacher. I'd never been locked down before, but she had many times. In that moment, no one was entirely sure what was happening at the Capitol across the street. Communication was unclear, and chaos was unfolding. I spent the next several hours barricaded alone in my office responding to those texts and emails, seeking more information, fueled by adrenaline and maybe a touch of dark humor. After I searched the office for items that could be used as makeshift weapon, weapons, I found a bottle of whiskey that someone had stashed in a cupboard. 
and I took a picture of myself with it to send to concerned relatives in an effort to assure them that I was okay, that, that this was going to be okay, trying to inject a lighter note. The truth is we had no idea how bad things were. At the Capitol that day, we didn't know how much damage was being done to our country, to the building, to the people in that building. It wasn't until I emerged from the office hours later to finish the job of certifying the election that it all began to hit me. My colleagues and I, the staff at the Capitol, the law enforcement officers there, we had just lived through a coup. Some are trying to call it an attempted coup, but let's be clear, just because it didn't succeed doesn't make it any less dangerous or any less of a coup. On January 6, 2021, a lawless mob breached the U.S. Capitol, the seat of American democracy, with the most evil and destructive intent. They were going to take the law into their own hands, disrupt Congress as it counted the Electoral College votes, and overturn the lawful election of Joseph Biden as our 46th president. These weren't tourists. These weren't protesters or concerned American patriots. They weren't people who came there without a plan. Hell, they had t-shirts saying that they were starting a civil war on January 6th. The individuals who overran the Capitol were violent invaders, hell-bent on preventing the peaceful transition of power, no matter the cost. They broke windows, they rammed doors, they chanted that they wanted to hang the vice president and shoot the Speaker of the House. This wasn't hyperbole, they brought the tools to do it. At least four police officers died as a result of the attack. Others were tased, rioters tried to shoot one of them with his own gun. Scores of other officers suffered severe injuries as they were beaten with pipes, and flagpoles, some with the American flag attached, and they were sprayed with chemicals. Every single officer who was on site that day has mental scars from what they experienced. Members of Congress, staff, and reporters were forced to take cover in the Capitol and the adjoining buildings, under furniture, barricading ourselves for hours on end, while Trump's supporters raged nearby. This was not a peaceful protest. These were crimes against our country and against the U.S. Constitution itself. It's fitting that we're gathered here at the National Constitution Center just across the street from Independence Hall where American democracy was forged. I can think of no better location to serve as the backdrop as we proclaim loudly for everyone to hear that we will not give up on our democracy. The attack on our Capitol was a very obvious manifestation of the big lie being told by the former president and his supporters in order to maintain power at all costs. But it's far from the only attempt to undermine our democracy and our elections that we've seen recently. There's been a continued assault on voting rights by state legislatures across the country ramping up in the last decade. And nowhere has that assault been more furious than in Pennsylvania ranging from attempts to gerrymander legislative districts for political advantage, to engaging in political theater, masquerading as legislative hearings to endorse lies that cast doubt on our elections and secure voting processes, undermining measures such as universal mail-in ballots that make it easier for eligible voters to exercise their freedom to vote. Democratic norms and the truth itself have largely been thrown out the window in pursuit of raw political power. The steady drumbeat that inspired rioters to take up arms on January 6, 2021 has not faded away. The big lie that the election was stolen is still being repeated daily by the former president, his allies in right-wing news outlets on social media, and from the corridors of power in state and federal government. It has infected our society. The greatest threat to our democracy is making it meaningless and hollow, and that's what the insurrectionists and the politicians still, still supporting them are trying to do. By sowing chaos and confusion and doubt, they seek to undermine our democratic systems for every election to come, and we cannot let that happen. Make no mistake, those who sit silently and refuse to condemn these lies or who make cowardly statements 
about not being sure about the election results are just as guilty. We have reached this point because the former president and his supporters lied to Americans about our election. And as long as that lie goes unchallenged, there is no middle ground. There can be no reconciliation and unity until there's a universal acknowledgement of a shared truth. We all face a choice to ensure the American story continues to be told by protecting our democratic systems and holding those who try to destroy them accountable. Or we can let the American democracy end. It's obvious that these agents of chaos will keep using lies to enact more damaging voting restrictions and prevent Americans from participating in our democracy, which is why action is needed at every level of government now. I know that many listening today, organizers across the country, many of you are exhausted. You have fought tirelessly, beating back voting restrictions and other anti-democratic policies at every turn. Just as one battle ends, another pops up, like an unpleasant game of whack-a-mole, but with really high stakes. Your work is invaluable, but we know you cannot do it alone. The federal government has an opportunity to act and we must. The House of Representatives has repeatedly shown our commitment to advancing voting rights and election protections. Last year, we passed the For the People Act again, as well as the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and the Protecting Our Democracy Act. Now it's up to the Senate to move on these issues with urgency. Majority Leader Schumer has committed to advancing voting rights legislation in the coming weeks with a promise to vote on a rules change to the filibuster if necessary by Martin Luther King Day. We need to hold him to those promises. With widespread support for both the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and the Senate drafted Freedom to Vote Act, we will continue to press the Senate for action and we welcome all of your help in that quest. As members of Congress, our most sacred obligation under the Constitution is to protect the right of the American people to choose their own representatives. We must seize this moment to protect our voting rights and our elections while we still can. The fact that an archaic Senate rule, which is not in the Constitution and has hundreds of exceptions to it already, the fact that that has enabled an extremist minority to hold up such critical legislation is unacceptable especially in the wake of an all-out assault on the U.S. Constitution that took place one year ago today. If the filibuster is an insurmountable hurdle to protecting our democracy, it's time for the filibuster to go. Our fight to protect U.S. elections and ensure every American's vote is counted is far from over. This is the moment to turn up the pressure. I look forward to working alongside all of you to push this across the finish line. One year after an unprecedented, unprecedented attack, by, on our government by supporters of a sitting U.S. president, anti-democratic forces continue to press lies to undermine future elections. I cannot stress how critical it is for us to maintain a united front to put loyalty to country above partisan considerations or any other allegiances. The threats we face are too great to stay silent. In this fight, every voice makes a difference, and every one of us has a role to play, whether at the polls, whether organizing, whether working um, for government agencies or for nonprofits. In this fight, we all can make a difference. We must reject the lies and stand united to ensure American democracy survives. Thank you. And with that, I would like to introduce Councilwoman Helen Gim. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Scanlon, and good afternoon, everybody. On January 6, 2021, white supremacists, militia members, and hundreds of adherents to the former president stormed the U.S. Capitol in order to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election. Nine people died in connection to the January 6th assault on the Capitol, and more than 150 officers were seriously injured. As horrifying as the events of January 6th were, the weeks and months that have ensued have brought neither calm 
nor comfort to a nation whose democracy teeters still on a knife's edge. On the one year anniversary, I want to welcome all of you to this critically important conversation about defending democracy and the conscious, purposeful work we have to do to not just defend and preserve, but to breathe new life, to expand and to lift up our democracy to meet this moment. I'm Helen Gim, I'm a Philadelphia City Council member at large, and I'm honored to join everybody here today from the National Constitution Center. I want to thank Pastor Nicholas O'Rourke and Congresswoman Mary Gay Scanlon for their opening remarks that set the tone for this panel discussion and the critically important role that all of us have to play in this moment. After all, what happened at the US Capitol did not start there. It has been brewing across our nation as we become the first generation to see the US transition into a multiracial majority. The expansion of women in Congress and at the highest levels of government, and in the footsteps of the first black president of the United States. It has been brewing here in our own state of Pennsylvania, where a sitting state senator was present in Washington, D.C. on January 6th, and more than 62 Pennsylvanians were formally charged in the January 6th riots. It lives in the actions we've seen by our own state legislature to advance efforts to impose further voting restrictions and invasive voter ID laws. But let's also be clear that the defenders of democracy are each one of us, ordinary Americans, called in an extraordinary time to defend our voting rights, to decry the ridiculous sham efforts to reopen the November 2020 results, and to ensure that voters, voters will decide the fate of our nation, not tyrants and autocrats. Here at home, we had our own local heroes, city commissioners, an attorney general, and so many others across party lines who reaffirmed our commitment to a constitutional democracy and reignited our common decency. I come out of movements for justice and I'm so proud to have seen incredible organizations, Common Defense, All Voting is Local, New Pennsylvania Project, the Working Families Party, a better PA, an API PA, and so many others on the front lines in fighting to challenge these anti-democratic assaults. Because on this somber day, the truth is, is that our nation and this city, this city of liberty and history, shone brightly on a national stage to show an America striving for a democracy that is more alive and vibrant than ever. When our nation was at its most vulnerable, my most proudest moments are standing outside the Constitution Center in November 2020 as Philadelphia put on the loudest, proudest dance party for democracy, drowning out the hate, the violent bomb threats with a people's party that filled our streets. On that day, our Constitution became more than just mere historic artifact. Its words moved off the page and into the streets, defined by us, a people filled and moving with joy, with purpose, and with a vision of a nation by the people, for the people, of the people. And in the aftermath, I will say that my most urgent need was to go directly and talk to our youth, launching a listening tour in high school civic classrooms all over the city of Philadelphia, joined by my partners at the city and state level to answer young people's questions, which echoed our own. Does my vote really count? Can my voice make a difference? And the answer is yes, always yes. Where we go from January 6th is going to take all of us, challenging disinformation, rallying against election sabotage bills, protecting our election officials, and preventing elections from becoming vulnerable to partisan influence. And then the positive, the future, expanding voter protections and language access at the polls, pushing for Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Acts at the national level. Today we will be discussing those questions and more with an incredible and brilliant panel whom I'd like to now invite to the stage. Can we bring everybody forward? Welcome everybody.
So I have the great honor of moderating a wonderful panel with these four individuals. Um, Kadita Kenner is the founding executive at director of the New Pennsylvania Project, a voting rights organization modeled after the successful New Georgia Project founded by Stacey Abrams in 2014. Um, the New Pennsylvania Project's primar primary focus is to civically engage, register, mobilize, and empower often ignored constituents, especially young people, communities of color in rural, urban, and suburban Pennsylvania to transform and expand the electorate in our commonwealth. I'd also like to uh, recognize Lene Mies Dietrich. Lene is the program associate of the Veterans Organizing Institute and a 10-year veteran of the US Navy and the US Coast Guard. After being discharged from the military for being transgender, she began working with Common Defense, the Poor People's Campaign, and J Street. She is a fierce advocate for the rights of the institutionally disadvantaged. Welcome, Lene. And the Reverend Nicholas O'Rourke, whom you heard from earlier. Reverend O'Rourke is the pastor at the Living Water United Church of Christ in Oxford Circle. He is the state director of organizing he is the State Director of Organizing for the Pennsylvania Working Families Party and the Faith Leaders Caucus Co-Chair of Power Interfaith. And finally, rounding us out is Mohan Seishadri. Mohan is the Executive Director of the Asian Pacific Islander Political Alliance. Previously, Mohan managed electoral and organizing programs for Planned Parenthood across Central and Eastern Pennsylvania. Additionally, they serve as a board member of Planned Parenthood Pennsylvania Advocates and PAC. Welcome everybody to this wonderful panel. Thank you so much for joining us on this important day. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Okay, so I thought we can open, and we'll start with Kadita, maybe in the order in which we um, introduce you first. Um, I mean, we are here a year later from January 6th, and it might help to just hear from you as citizens, as organizers, as veterans, what was going through your mind as you watched the events unfold on January 6th? Um, what, you know, what were you thinking was the most important thing that needed to happen? And um, we can go a little further, but if you have time, um, you know, what do you think allowed so many people to act with impunity, to be able to um, attack uh, officers in uniform, to storm a Capitol, and to openly say, as I think Congresswoman Mary Gay Scanlon, and to proudly declare that they were at civil war in our nation. So, Kadita, why don't we start with you? Thank you. Uh, I'm grateful to be here with this incredible panel and uh, to be with you today, Councilwoman, so thank you. Uh, January 6th was a Wednesday last year, and on Wednesdays, I used to hold an event planning call, an organizing event planning call with my organization. And I went on with the day. I mean, we knew what the acts were going to be that day. We had heard previously, you know, that there was going to be some mobilization there at the Capitol that day. And we went on with our day that Wednesday. We had a two o'clock staff meeting. And as we were on Zoom during this time, obviously, uh, in this meeting, and while it was happening, everyone on the call was saying, Kadita, are you not paying attention to what's happening on the news? Do you see what's happening? And I said, yeah, absolutely see what's happening. Let's continue this meeting. We have work to do. Our work must continue because if you see what's happening at the Capitol, you know that we cannot stop the effort in which we are engaged in, which is to defend democracy, expand democracy for all. And so, you know, it's, it's no secret, um, you know, that there were so many who felt enabled, um, had the privilege to show up on the US Capitol steps and cause chaos, cause chaos and disrupt our norms. You know, it was a sad day, but I can't say that I was surprised. I, during that administration, pretty much nothing surprised me. But I do know that we have work to do in this moment um, because those who did show up on those Capitol steps on that Wednesday did feel as though they could act without impunity. Um, unfortunately, there are record numbers of those folks who are currently um, going through the judicial process come from Pennsylvania. And they were led there, you know, under the assumption that we did not have a free and fair election here, not only in the Commonwealth, but across the country. And we know that to be inaccurate. We know that our election was proved to be accurate, not only by the voters who decided, but by the courts, both state and federal levels, that confirmed that the election was accurate. 
So this is where the issue lies, is that here, even in the Commonwealth, we have elected officials who felt compelled to not only support the activities by being there in person, but supporting it financially by providing transportation to those that showed up on the US Capitol on that day. We have an insurrection issue, not only on those steps, but here in the Commonwealth with bad actors who currently sit in Harrisburg who felt as though it was okay to disrupt our free and fair election. That is the tenet of our democracy. We're here today to talk about defending democracy. If we don't have free and fair elections, if we don't have access to the ballot, that's the issue. That's the issue at hand. Thank you so much, Kadita. Um, Lene? Um, okay, so I was, on January 6th, I was uh, helping uh, facilitate a uh, Veterans Organizing Institute uh, cohort. Uh, we were uh, teaching organizing principles and it was, it happened, uh, you know, it got kind of serious over our lunch break. And when we came back, um, we like the, the facilitators kind of came together before beforehand and, you know, we kind of went back and forth and we were like, are, Lena, are we going to keep doing this? Like, or do we do we keep going or, you know, is this just too much for to ask people to, you know, ignore for the sake of training? And we made the decision to keep going, uh, you know, could it, it pretty much for the exact same. This is why we do the work. Um, I don't think anyone that I was working with was surprised that there were um, protests and surprised that they got um, violent. Um, I think it, for my own part uh, and for my part alone, uh, I may have m underestimated uh, the, the kind of uh, brainwashing that uh, has gone into uh, the that particular movement. And so I was not entirely convinced that they would actually do something so brash as to storm the Capitol. That was terrifying and heartbreaking and, and infuriating uh, to me and to all of the veterans that I know. Um, like we all, the ones that I work with, we all felt more or less the same way because we took an oath uh, to defend the United States of America. And that didn't end because we no longer wear uniforms. Mm -hmm. And so we felt that this was, this was incredibly personal. And to kind of, you know, speak a little more to why people felt emboldened to do that, there is a, a very proficient propaganda machine uh, on on the other side, who they they've put a lot of effort into um, making themselves into not just a political minority, but an aggrieved political minority, such that when they say, "Well, there were voting irregularities, and there were, you know, these other these other things," the vote was stolen, and and it just it, it's a logical progression, a logical escalation from this aggrieved minority status within the political system to this was not a fair election and we're going to do an insurrection about it. Um, and in order to, in order to, you know, prevent these things from happening again, we need to make sure that instead of restricting voting access, we widen voting access. We make sure that more people can vote. Um, and it is that's one of the things that they desperately do not want because they know that when people show up, they lose. So it's really important to prevent this from happening again, that we pass the Freedom to Vote Act, that we pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Thank you so much, Lene. Pastor O'Rourke. January 6, 2021, what a day. I uh, too was, um, not in a meeting, but I was doing some self-meeting with myself on that day. Uh, I think if I recall correctly, that was the same day that uh, uh, the GameStop uh, uh, situation took place and everybody was talking about that on social media, as well as the activities happening at the Capitol. I was thinking about, now that we have duly elected a new president, a new vice president, 
all of the things that we in people's movements had been planning to further for the betterment of our own communities and our people. Things like budgets and where money's being allocated. Talking about canceling student debt. We're talking about vaccinating everybody right then at the time. Remember, we didn't have all that together. Uh, talking about freeing immigrant families and ending family separation with reparations for the families that were harmed. We're talking about uh, creating a bill for $2,000 survival checks um, uh, through the entirety of the COVID emergency. We were talking about um, uh, uh, economic aid and aid economic, uh, aiding economic equity through public-private investment for black and brown entrepreneurs, prioritizing black business owners and um, uh, focusing on fighting for universal health care and free COVID tests. And we were fighting for a $15 minimum wage. These were all things that we were excited about. Canceling written mortgage debt. Um, uh, one of the things that Council, um, Council Member Gim as well as uh, Council, uh, Congresswoman Cori Bush and others have lifted up as a major concern. Talking about climate justice, uh, among other things, there was a laundry list of stuff that we were looking forward to advance. And yet, the Republican Party and its supporters Open air white supremacists and Christian nationalists, I can say that as a pastor, were actively doing what they have always done, committing to building power at any cost for the long term. We're seeing it right now as it relates to uh, the gouging uh, of abortion rights, uh, uh, also something that has been gouged or that, that Chief Justice John Roberts has been at the center of. And so they have been committed to this. Checking away or chipping away at our voting rights is not something that just happened under Trump. This is something that has been happening for well over a decade and even longer than that. And their long-term commitment, in the same way that they have long-term played for judges in the, in the federal judiciary, their long-term commitment has allowed them to continue to press even two years later, I think we are, right? After Donald Trump has lost the election, that he still is in control of the Republican Party, that he's still campaigning right now for 24, calling this a big lie. We also recognize that much of the reason why those who have rebel confederacy sensibilities still cling to things, big lies like the lost cause and how we don't often talk about that and how that compels them. And so for me, I was really wrestling with having to uh, 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 make space in light of all of the, of, the, of, the, of the wins that we needed to secure for our communities that we have been fighting for, the reason why we went to vote in the first place, that we would also have to deal with Trumpism on the days leading after that. That, that when we're talking about uh, defending our democracy and, and ensuring certainly the most important component of that, the right to vote, when we're talking about this, it, it's, it, it is, it's about the very core of what it means for us to be the USA. And when you have folks who are committed to fighting against that, to dismantling it so they can keep power, then you start to recalculate and recalibrate about in terms of what you're going to do. And so, yeah, I think uh, since then, uh, I've been clear about um, uh, the fact that this is not something that's just blanket is democracy or, or it, it doesn't deal with just one theme, but we're talking about white nationalism, right? Like we need to be in a place now where we can say that and not, that not be perceived as radical. It is what it is. We're talking about folks who were lifting up crucifixes, right? On the Capitol grounds right next to nooses, right? People who were waving Confederate flags and Jesus flags at the same time. You're talking about folks who were using religion to, uh, uh, to destroy a country, Right, and to advance their uh, harmful policies right, uh, o o and exact them over communities of color, minority communities, poor working class people all over the US. And so, I don't know, I think I've just been uh, uh, recommitting myself to the long-term fight in the same way that they're committed to making sure that we protect democracy and get back to what we started to do on that day, which was focusing on all those wins that we certainly need still to this day. Yes. Thank you so much, Pastor O'Rourke. And Mohan. You know, Similar to everyone else, it was a Wednesday, we were at work. We thought about recommitting to the work. We, we talked about what this means for you know, our, our ability to, to work on behalf of our community in the future. But th there wasn't a lot of surprise, right? And it was really only when I actually talked to our community members about it after the fact that the, the rage, the anger at the injustice of it all really set in. APIPA, the Asian Pacific Islander Political Alliance, is Pennsylvania's first and only statewide Asian Pacific Islander political and advocacy organization. We work year round to build power for our communities across Pennsylvania in 15 different languages. And in 2020, we were successful in surging Asian Pacific Islander voter turnout to double to twice as much as it has ever been in Pennsylvania's history, historic turnout. And that vote share overwhelmingly went to Joseph Biden, to our president. 
And that is the election that the Republican Party, that these Republican activists wanted to overturn. The, our communities, communities of color, working class communities, spent a year slogging through a pandemic, through underinvestment in testing, through underinvestment in treatment, through, in our case, blatant disregard for our language access needs, for the needs of our community across the board. And our community still turned out higher than it ever had before and voted for Joe Biden. And an entire party and activists of that party decided that they didn't like that, that they didn't like our community speaking out, that they didn't like our communities making our voices heard, they didn't like our communities being included in our democracy, and that they were going to take action to overturn these free and fair election results to make sure that our voices were silenced. So when it comes to the motivations of the folks who involved in the insurrection a year ago today. I think that a lot of ink has been spilled. I think our folks have a lot of great thoughts as to the why. I want us to center on the voices of the people they were trying to silence, our working class, immigrant and refugee community members, the new citizens who fought through barrier after barrier, who came from countries where they didn't have the right to vote, where they didn't have democracy, where they didn't have freedom of speech. And they came here and they wanted to make their voices heard. And folks who didn't like that, wanted to erase their voices and make sure they could never do it again. And I think about what needs to happen over the next two years to ensure that we're not just securing the right to vote, not just protecting the existing access that we have, but expanding it so that all our community members can be included in the fabric of democracy. And that means voter protections at the polls, that means more drop boxes, that means expanding mail-in voting, that means language access across the board throughout our entire society. And that work happens every day. We're really proud to be a part of it, but we need support from everyone across the Commonwealth if we're gonna make our democracy a lived reality. Thank you so much um, for that. You know, I, it is so powerful to hear you say um, what you are engaged in, you know, the hard work of actually protecting voting rights on a regular basis as part of your job, but as part of our lived realities as people of color, as representing communities that have long been shut out. But it was also incredibly powerful to you know, remind ourselves that, of course, the cause of the January 6th insurrection were violent um, insurrectionists who, you know, charged and stormed the Capitol. But the vulnerabilities and maybe even the seeds of it, um, whether intentional or not, are rooted in things that have happened over time, especially to communities. The constant wearing down and erosion of voting rights, the lack of confidence in communities and especially in young people, that their voice and their vote will count in the weaponizing of religion um, and other uh, protected rights, even free speech, to declare yourself immune from the responsibilities of a democracy. Um, and then I think what you all had said is that this anniversary is a commitment for a democracy that doesn't simply go on autopilot, but a democracy that is more vibrant, more committed, expanding, especially given the new realities of a multiracial majority here in the United States, what that looks like, what that means, and the possibilities it breaks open. So I wanna thank everybody for that. Um, so my second question is PA, Pennsylvania is and has always been a battleground state. We talk about it all the time. It's always perceived in sort of this, you know, kind of militaristic terms around elections and, um, and how it has been frequently under attack, um, particularly, you know, and let's be honest, by Harrisburg Republicans. So when we are out there on the ground, because we are not dealing with people who are, you know, following every single thing that's happening in state legislatures or county commission commissioners or town halls or city halls. What kind of dynamic are we creating when we, you know, with this battleground aspect, with the eyes of the nation on us, but internally with a, you know, a lot of questioning and concern about um, our role in the nation. Um, so what kind of dynamic do you see, like in particularly in your engagement with voters um, and, to you, what are some of the greatest threats to our democracy and to voting rights right now um, that, that you're feeling in this moment? Yes. You know, we're a battleground, mostly due to gerrymandering. Uh, let's not forget about gerrymandering here in the Commonwealth. And there's all types of gerrymandering that we're involved in. 
There's political gerrymandering. There's racial gerrymandering. There's prison gerrymandering. There's judicial gerrymandering. Lots of gerrymandering happening here in the Commonwealth, which leads us to believe that this is a battleground. But Pennsylvanians of all colors, we want a government that works for us. For so long, we are not seeing our needs being met. And so when we're knocking on these doors and talking to potential voters and trying to persuade folks to actually join the electorate, we're trying to talk to them about the issues that matter. And these are the issues that have been mattering for so long here in the Commonwealth. I think about the need to raise the minimum wage here. We've been stuck at the federal level for $7.25 an hour for 13 years when every single state neighboring Pennsylvania has increased their minimum wage, some on the path to 15 already. When we're talking to folks on the ground, we're talking about economic justice issues. You know, we're talking about the fact that we do need to protect voting rights. I'm so proud of communities of color who came out against all odds, all obstacles and barriers put before them and cast their ballots in record numbers in 2022, 2020, and hopefully in 2022 as well. You know, and as Mohan said, you know, now that these voices have come out in record numbers, we have a faction who wants to suppress these votes and do everything possible to stop folks from having better access to the ballot. I wanna talk a moment about some of the acts that are happening in Harrisburg, because this is all relative. You know, when we were knocking on doors and talking to folks, it's the pocketbook issues that really matter to them the most. But they need also the information about what is happening to the erosion of our democracy, and particularly the erosion to the independent judiciary, not only in the Commonwealth, but in the federal government as well. I think about bad actors in Harrisburg who currently want to change the way in which we elect judges. Pennsylvania, one of the few states in the entire country, we elect every single one of our judges. That doesn't happen in other states. But yet we have legislators in Harrisburg who want to gerrymander the judiciary and change the way in which we actually elect judges. There's so much that they could be doing. You know, seven billion plus dollars sitting in rainy day funds when it's been storming on Pennsylvanians for years. I don't know what type of rain they're waiting to see. But instead of passing legislation that's actually going to be helpful to people and help our daily lives, they continue to move on legislation to erode democracy and make it less um, accessible for us to access the ballot. You know, people are working two and three jobs and a 12 hour window on a Tuesday in a cold November isn't the thing that's going to get most folks to show up to a poll when you're working two and three shift jobs and you have kids to take care of, you have homework to get done and dinner to cook. And so we must expand the electorate, but we have to expand voting rights in order for that to happen. We have to have same day voter registration like other states have successfully been able to do. North Carolina can do it. Why can't Pennsylvania do this? We need to improve. We need to make sure that we are working for the people. And I think the power grabbing and the dy dynamics that are happening, particularly in Harrisburg, is absurd. You know, we have um, balance of power for reasons. Part, we're here in the Constitution Center. There's balance of power for a reason. And right now, the conflicts of interest and the power grabbing and the legislature trying to usurp the authority of the executive branch and the legislature trying to usurp the authority of the judicial branch our democracy is at stake. It is in peril. We saw that happen not only in action on January 6th, but we see it every day in the capital of Harrisburg. We have to do better. Thank you, Lita. Lena? Uh, so I would say that, that the dynamic uh, that, that I'm seeing is primarily one which you know, cries out for uh, voter information, which to me, uh, says that there's a big problem with voter misinformation and voter disinformation. Um, and that is the project of our adversaries in the Republican Party. Um, that has, that is, you know, I think that's a, a more broadly federal uh, problem. And we saw it come to a head on January 6th and um, holding the people who push all of these, all of this misinformation and disinformation to account is the only way that we can start to, um, that we can that we can turn that faucet off and start mopping up the mess. Um, I would say that that it won't solve the the larger issue of having to, you know, you know, we're talking to people who 
this, this propaganda machine works primarily for people who are being told what they want to hear. And there is a slippery slope from that into uh, white nationalist and uh, even, you know, proto-fascist um, rhetoric and, and political beliefs from there, uh, which as a, as, as a Jewish trans woman really, really scares me. Uh, and it's something that I, I really try to keep an eye on. Um, so, you know, it, it, I don't think it is a, a coincidence that shortly after the election of the former president um, and during his tenure, we saw a huge um, spike in anti-Semitic uh, hate crimes. Uh, and, uh, you know, not just graffiti, but like in several instances, uh, Torah scrolls were desecrated and uh, people have been attacked, people have been stabbed. Uh, so it's, it's not that the political tendencies of the former president and the people who were using the former president to push their agenda were necessarily uh, new and then imposed upon people, but there were a large portion of people who were hearing for the first time that it was okay to say what they'd actually been thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is important that that misinformation, that disinformation pipeline that's, that funnels so many people, not just to this, this is what I want to hear, but also the introduction to those ideas that are you know, in bad faith presented in a way that makes them make sense, is probably the, the one most critical thing that we can do. And that involves finding the people, finding out who is responsible for organizing and arranging the January 6th attacks and making sure that they are held to account. Uh, and I think that will be the, the thing that most positively uh, influences the dynamic that we experience on the ground. Thank you so much, Lena. Nick? Yeah, um, I'm going to agree with you, as well as add one component, not only do we need to combat misinformation, uh, it's rampant, uh, but we also need to be able to deliver so that when you go to make your case to voters, you have something to point to to say, this is the reason why. Along with the erosion of voting and democracy in this country over the last decade or more, really it's since the beginning, along with that, there has also been voter disenfranchisement, disenchantment, people who are not seeing the return on their electoral investment, if you will. And this is the reason why it was important for me to lift up kind of what I was thinking about and to always kind of keep a mental, uh, keep a note nearby about where we were as a movement, as people groups, as an electorate, as voting citizens of the United States, about where we were mentally, about what we thought was possible, what we were inspired by. Because it was that bill, right, of goods, and they are a wonderful bill of goods, that was sold and, and campaigned on and then what ultimately delivered for voters. And here we are two years in, and the number of things that are lifted up on that list, some of us might even question whether or not they're appropriate to talk about in this, in this context. Sometimes, you know, when we talk about the, 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 the terrible things that happened in the Trump administration and we quietly know that there are still things happening, occurring over from the Trump administration currently under this administration. When we do not deliver, when we do not muster the courage, the boldness to call a thing a thing and to do what must be necessary to ensure the fundamentals of this country, then of course people who are going to, who want power are going to, to take it away. And I think it's, I think, I think we need to make sure that we are prioritizing delivering, right? We don't, as I shared this earlier, um, a number of folks, I know I have run into a number of people who I, I don't know necessarily that I have anything yet to give them, to show them why it was valuable for them to, 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 to vote in 2020, even while it was absolutely essential that they did so. And so here we are moving into the next election cycle. Actually, as you all know, here in Philadelphia, we have election cycle every six months, that we, we should be uh, uh, turning out the vote now, not a month before election day, not a couple of weeks before election day. Let's not have a couple of rallies the week before election day and pretend and to be surprised if things don't turn out. As you all know, Biden won, but everybody else lost. And so it's important for us to do the work now. Talk to the communities that are disenchanted, disenfranchised now. Deliver for them now. Take courage and boldness to be able to move any obstacle out the way to deliver what they need now. If you tell somebody that your vote got them $15 as a minimum and they're working on 25, I guarantee that can get somebody to the voting, to the voting booth. If you tell migrants who are 
who really, you know, that's a whole other conversation, but that, that, that they, they're safe here. They have, they have a home here, that this is their home too. I can guarantee you, you're going to get a lot of support for folks who are there. And so I don't want to belabor the point. But again, if I could just say delivery and attacking of, of misinformation, I think are essential for us to be able to quell what's happening and to be able to build a democracy that we all deserve. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Mohan? Absolutely. You know, I can't help but agree with everything that everyone has said. You know, there was a time when politicians campaigned on things that people needed. They, com they campaigned on improving people's material lives, and then they got into office and then they delivered. And instead, now we have a Republican state legislature, a Republican state house and state senate. But two years into a pandemic, they're not going to give you labor rights. They're not going to give you workers' protections. They don't want testing. They don't want vaccines. They don't want COVID treatments. They don't want to expand health care. They don't want to do anything that the voters of Pennsylvania need and that the voters of Pennsylvania have consistently voted for over the last couple of years when it comes to our congressional delegation, when it comes to who we elected as governor and attorney general, when it comes to who we elected president in 2020. Instead, they're going to chip away and chip away and chip away at the right to vote, make it harder for you to vote so that you can't make your voice heard on those issues that are important to you and your family, and maybe violate your privacy by revealing your personal private information through voter ID rhetoric and election fraud rhetoric in the process. And on the other hand, you know, we have candidates like our, you know, on the, on the Democratic side, we have a gubernatorial candidate who is instead releasing visionary platforms when it comes to expanding the right to vote and protecting the right to vote. I think the contrast is clear. I think our, our people see it. I think our people have seen it for the last couple of years. And I think that if we reduce these barriers to participation, it would be if we reduce the gerrymandering, if we opposed voter ID, if we made it easier rather than harder to vote, the people of Pennsylvania would make their voice heard even more loudly and clearly than they have over the last couple of years. So why is it that you know in a battleground state, where as Pennsylvania goes, so does the entire country. We're making it harder to vote. We're not giving people what they need and we're trying to silence their voices. Um, so we're gonna switch up the panel order a little bit. We're gonna start with Mohan. Um, and I think the, um, one of the questions that we've got um, right now is that many of the attacks on democracy are undoubtedly happening because of the shifting demographics of, of what we're seeing, not just around the nation, but also here in Pennsylvania. Um, our public schools for the first time are majority students of color. Um, as I have said before, uh, the U.S. is now seeing the first multiracial majority um, that it's seen um, that it's seen in since the since its founding. Right. So the. Um, the, uh, I think one of the questions that we've got is, um, we talked a lot about the attacks on communities of color, but where are you seeing openings and work that has been really positive, moving people forward? Um, I think Pastor Nick talked a lot about um, wins and what it looks like when people actually win and how does that reciprocate back into voting? Um, and so I'd love to hear from you where within uh, the push as um, as communities of color and non-white voters are coming to the polls in larger and larger numbers and in areas that have been voting historically white, where are you seeing like hope and possibility and real active movement um, in order for us to concentrate our efforts as well? So we'll start I, with Mohan and then we'll go to uh, Nick and then Lena and Kadita. I think the, a clear example of that is the victory the Asian American community and specifically the Chinese community had in Philadelphia recently with the dramatic expansion of the right to vote with for the first time ever having Chinese on our ballots. You know, this has been a long time coming as our Chinese community has grown in Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia specifically. And it was specifically thanks to Asian American community organizations coming together around the census to deliver needed dollars to the entire state of Pennsylvania by mobilizing our communities around the census successfully that resulted in this expansion. And I think now it's time to see similar ex expansions when it comes to Korean language, Vietnamese language, other uh, Asian languages 
as well as outside of Philadelphia, where our communities are growing across the board. You know, Pennsylvania has never been an all white state outside Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, but now more than ever, we have communities of color growing in the Philadelphia suburbs, in the Lehigh Valley, in Scranton and State College, in Harrisburg and the Harrisburg suburbs, in Erie. And those folks need as much access to our government they need as much access to civic engagement, and they need as much access to the right to vote as anyone else living in those areas. Wonderful, thank you so much, Mohan. Yeah, I think um, one of the most important uh, opportunities I think is often missed, uh, I think it's in this moment, is recognizing that the policies that we need to win on, right, the deliverables that, that have, folks have been asking for, are not one-sided policies. These are, these are investments and policies and laws that the lion's share of the United States electorate likes. Did anybody remember the, uh, during the Trump years, in that last little block there, last few months, when uh, the very next day after, I think, announcing $2,000 stimulus checks, Senator Bernie Sanders was on the Senate floor with a big old blow up on the floor talking about the importance of $2,000 stimulus checks. That was a policy that was advanced by Trump. Also something that is popular amongst progressives and others. These are things that it, it is part of the problem is uh, believing rather that the disinformation is true, uh, 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 resonates or correlates to people's uh, desires for their, for their life, for their country, for what they want to see happen here. Um, yes, there's misinformation out there, but if you tell someone we have what you need for them, then I think that there's an opportunity for us to be able to build. And I think it's important for us to um, uh, spend time continuously lifting those things up, right? Confront uh, every conversation. I think someone lifted up earlier the importance for us to constantly combat misinformation, but also combat misinformation, not that's just proliferating on social media, but even amongst the halls of power. How many know there are a number of elected officials, right, of not the Republican Party, who decided that they would, in the, the light of January 6, uh, blame all the progressives for the losses that they saw, uh, among other things, right? And I think this is problematic in, in our ability to be able to pull together a majority that's going to advance what people want. We have seen recently uh, Senator Manchin uh, turn uh, on his entire caucus. And so I think it's so important for us to remember that Senator Manchin uh, has to go back to answer to West Virginians about things that most of his electorate likes and wants. That is a win for us, and we should stop leaving that power on the table, conceding that information, conceding that vantage point, arguing it, advancing it, fighting for it, uh, and continuously lifting it up. Thank you so much. So this is about openings, places of hope and possibility, and then I have one more question after this. So Lena and then Kadita. Uh, so I would say that probably um, the most, the, the biggest opening that I've seen and like in the, the biggest, you know, point of hope that I've seen, uh, it kind of started coalescing um, really around the uh, Black Lives Matter protests and has continued on through uh, to our, our, current, uh, our current time is, is this, um, we're, we're starting to realize, you, you mentioned that, that uh, you know, the, the U.S. kind of has this, this uh, multiracial major, uh, majority uh, now and, and um, it, it is set to displace a, a decrepit status quo, and uh, the only people who are really, you know, fighting against that are the people who have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo. Uh, and for a long time, a lot of that energy has gone into uh, trying to divide us into our separate communities and and uh, drive wedges. And you know. Uh, there is a, a long and uh, sometimes friendly, sometimes extremely troubled history between the Jewish and the black communities. Uh, and I'm starting to see those bridges uh, or those divides being bridged. Uh, I'm, I'm starting to see, uh, you know, multiracial coalitions come together uh, and work in ways that are uh, sensitive to the, the needs of uh, you know, the, the disadvantaged groups within that coalition and not be just necessarily overtaken by, by well-meaning but uh, very energetic uh, white people. Uh, and that really gives me hope that, that we're shifting to this, this uh, understanding that we do have that, that coalition and if we can just uh, give and take a little bit then we will we will be an overwhelming force uh, in politics. Thank you, Kadita. 
I'm going to keep this short. Act 77 was a bipartisan effort, Democrats and Republicans in Harrisburg, to expand access to the ballot, to ensure that we could vote early in the middle of a global pandemic, that we could cast ballots from the comfort of our homes. That's what led to the success of communities of color coming out in record numbers, is that we had better opportunities to cast our ballot. And now that we did come out in those record numbers, we see in Harrisburg how they're trying to stop those efforts and curtail the actual uh, items within Act 77 that allowed for us to have a more expanded democracy here by bringing more folks into the electorate. And I'm going to be very excited about what's going to happen in 2022 because we do have some folks now that are really, ex you know, really excited about the possibilities. Um, I think about the fact that there are 20% of all eligible black folks here in this country, in Pennsylvania, not registered to vote. 31% of all eligible Latinx folks eligible to vote, not registered. 42% of, of AAPI folks here in the Commonwealth eligible and not registered to vote. We have an opportunity to expand this electorate like never before. And I can't wait for it to happen here in 2022. We're going to, we're going to show up and we're going to show out and we're going to bring back this democracy here in the birthplace of American democracy as we stand here in this constitution. Center today, we're going to show up and we're going to show out and we're going to expand this electorate and elected officials beware. Yeah, sign us up. Sign us up. Um, so we have just a few minutes and maybe in a minute or so for each one of you. Um, what can Pennsylvanians do? I mean, we've got an audience who's watching right now. Um, we've got hopefully volunteers for each and every one of your organizations who are excited to be signed up for that mission. Um, so what can Pennsylvanians do um, to push back on the attacks on our democracy, but most important, to build a nation, a society that we all are part of? So Mohan? The first and simplest thing that folks can do is keep an eye out and make your voice heard when these attacks happen. Mm -hmm. We're going to be staring down the barrel as we have crucial U.S. Senate and gubernatorial races in Pennsylvania this, later this year as we have the 2024 presidential race coming down the pike as well. We're staring down the barrel of two years of attacks on democracy by a party and by a state legislature that it controls that are dedicated to doing everything we can to silence our voices. And we need everyday Pennsylvanians and we need every Pennsylvanian all across the Commonwealth standing up and fighting back against attacks on our right to vote, against attacks on vote by mail, against attempts to violate our privacy and put in place voter ID, and anything and everything else that is used to silence our freedom of speech and our right to vote. And we need that every single day over the next two years if we're going to continue making Pennsylvania a commonwealth that works for all of us. Thank you, Mohan. Nick? Nick? I'm going to say three basic things. Um, certainly one is uh, go vote. Uh, every single election cycle. Make sure that everybody that you have that's in the sphere of your influence is also registered to vote and knows how to go do so. Um, do not go to the ballot box without having a person with you um, to vote as well, so we can double our efforts. Secondly, I would encourage us uh, to not just vote, but to run for office. There are leaders and uh, there are champions out there uh, that are listening and that are tired of simply voting and feeling as if there's not much to their toolbox as it relates to pushing back and have never really considered or believed for a moment in themselves to put forward their name to be the next elected such and such a person from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania or elsewhere. Because certainly concerned citizens uh, in a republic or the so-called quote-unquote democracy uh, can help lead us out of, this, out of this terribly, terribly dark and chaotic age. And thirdly, I would encourage people to go to jury duty. Um, uh, we're talking a lot about how uh, the judiciary is doing this and doing that, and there's an intentional, uh, there was a, a long-term 30, 40-year play towards ensuring that, 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 that we recognize the ways in which the, ju the judiciary is weaponized to extract rights from communities of color, working class, working poor communities uh, all across this country to make it more viable for a minority rule to hold power. Make sure that wherever you have an opportunity, if you can, to go to jury duty, make your voice heard, push back on things that are taking place. And I think by doing these three things, at least, we will begin to engender some sense of commitment to the wider work of fixing and defending our democracy. Thank, Thank you, you, Nick. Lena, and then Kadita. Uh, so I would say two major things. First, uh, obviously vote. You know, 
bring two or three people with you who are going to vote and and try to get them to bring you know three eligible voters to vote and uh i would also say that um you know, you you should communicate with your elected officials. Uh, that's what they're there for. They represent you. So call, email, um, write write into your local newspaper. Uh, make your voice heard. Uh, and so, you know, that that's really what I have. <laughs> the Honorable John Lewis said that the most powerful nonviolent change agent in a democratic society is our vote. And so we've all said the number one thing for us to do is to vote. We vote twice a year here in the Commonwealth, every single year. So we need to make sure we do that. We need to also make sure that we're out here expanding the electorate. There are way too many Pennsylvanians, more than 1.1 million Pennsylvanians who are eligible to vote and not registered to vote in this moment. And it may sound like a daunting task, but if we're all working at this together, because this democracy doesn't just happen in a vacuum, we have to do something about this. So you have that opportunity as everyday Pennsylvanian, everyday citizen or non-citizen here to help register other folks to vote here in the Commonwealth. And the last thing we can do is let's talk to our elected officials. They work for us and they're supposed to do the things we tell them to do. And there's a groundswell of public opinion when you can show up to your state legislator's office and say to them, it is time for you to remove barriers from us voting and, and make it easier for us to access the ballot, not harder. Talk to your elected officials, reach out to your state rep, your state senator, let them know that you are in favor of expanding democracy by ensuring that we have better access to the ballot. That's what Pennsylvanians want. Thank you so much to this wonderful panel. Um, if you're at home, I hope you give them a wonderful round of applause to sign up and support their organizations that are going out there on the front lines. Um, as you heard today uh, from this incredible panel, the reality is, is that a strong democracy relies on a simple idea that has been such a journey to achieve, and that is justice. Justice for communities, justice in the economy, justice in housing, justice in our voting rights. Voting rights are not separate from other movements for justice, and the integration of them, the building and the hard work of creating and holding together a multiracial democracy and coalition is the biggest challenge that we face today, but as Kadita said, that there is hope that abounds as we see younger voters and voters of color and an expanded electorate merging in with, um, with, with uh, people from all over the nation and all over our state coming together to build a more stronger and vibrant democracy. Um, the conversation today that you heard is grounded in the importance of this fight, the severity of the threat before us, and the boldness in which we must protect and expand and to make our democracy come alive. And I hope what you heard today is that every single one of us is not only committed to the work, but we are ready to do the work. And here at the start of January 2022, um, we are going to be working harder than ever to organize our communities and to ensure that everyone, truly everyone, and especially our most vulnerable voices are seen and heard in this nation that we call the United States of America. And faith leaders, political leaders, organizers, we are all committed to this effort. This coalition is stronger and has always been stronger than the divisive, hateful campaign that's moved us that against our democracy. That is our way forward. We saw that on January 6th when this nation rose up and uh, denounced the attacks at the Capitol. Um, but this city is, this nation um, has lived through the, the ensuing weeks and months we have work to do um and and we look forward to seeing you all back here again um at the national constitution center thank you everybody for this opportunity okay double duty here all right, good afternoon, everyone, members of the free press, distinguished guests, and my fellow Pennsylvanians here today. Um, as you know, my name is Kadita Kenner, 
As the executive director of a voting rights organization with a primary purpose of expanding the electorate by registering Pennsylvanians to vote and encouraging voter participation in the Commonwealth twice a year, every year, it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce Pennsylvania's Attorney General Josh Shapiro. Um, Attorney General Josh Shapiro has been a defender of democracy. As the chief law enforcement officer in Pennsylvania, our AG represents the state and its agencies in any action brought by or against them. Attorney General Shapiro has defended our votes to ensure that every vote is counted, including attempts um, by, uh, by those bad actors to target voters of color here in the Commonwealth. Attorney General Shapiro has defended Pennsylvanians' right to vote safely by protecting our ability to vote by mail and early. He has defended our privacy by suing the United States Supreme Court to stop Republican efforts to obtain our private information. Attorney General Shapiro is defending us against extremists and bad actors' attempts to sabotage our free and fair elections. It is my pleasure to introduce the Commonwealth's Attorney General, Josh Shapiro. Good afternoon, Kadita. Thank you so very much uh, for the kind introduction. Appreciate you and your leadership here in the Commonwealth. And I know that Congresswoman Scanlon had to get back for votes in Washington, but I want to thank her for her leadership, as well as Councilwoman Helen Gim. I know you just had the opportunity to hear from some wonderful experts on a panel, and um, I want to thank them for the work they do in the trenches, from the pulpit, and from so many other important places in our community. It is good that we are here today here physically and here virtually today. I also think it's important that we are here today, important that we are gathering to solemnly mark and remember the violent insurrection at the US Capitol one year ago today. It was on that day that insurrectionists, compelled by a lie that was told by the former president and his enablers broke into our Capitol and invaded the halls of Congress in an attempt to stop the people's voice from being heard, to thwart the will of the people. They failed to upend 245 plus years of American democracy, but their actions brought into focus how critical it is to engage and take steps necessary to protect our democratic heritage, to perfect it, and importantly, to pass it on to the next generation. And as I've said since the beginning, our elected leaders have a duty to our country and to our democracy to tell the truth about why January 6th happened and to ensure that it never happens again by taking some very concrete steps. Sadly, too many of our leaders have failed to do just that, have failed our experiment in self-government. Here's the truth. You can draw a straight line between the lies, the litigation, to the events of January the 6th, and now, you can continue that straight line to voter suppression laws that are being passed by Republicans in state houses across the country. Here in Pennsylvania, the governor's veto pen can stop the dozens of voter suppression bills that have been proposed here, ones that we are seeing become law in states like Georgia and Texas. These bills will undermine our democracy when we should be focused on counting every single vote, on honoring and respecting the will of the people, not power grabs by certain politicians. These bills also limit voter participation and make clear that they believe, the authors of these bills believe, that certain people especially our black and brown community members, don't count. 
and shouldn't be heard in the conversation and shouldn't be part of the solution. That's the aim that so many of them have when they put forth these bills to exclude certain people from the American conversation. But that veto threat here in Pennsylvania has not stopped Republicans in Harrisburg from testing the limits on how to undermine our elections. These efforts started with an absurd hearing in Gettysburg featuring Rudy Giuliani making unethical and inaccurate claims of election fraud. It should be noted that because of Giuliani's lies and the efforts of the Office of Attorney General, he is no longer permitted to practice law in this country. Then, after that hearing, Republicans targeted Fulton County with their quote-unquote forensic audit, which led to the physical opening of the election machines there. All the while, their review turned up nothing, no fraud, none whatsoever. And in addition to not turning up any fraud, it cost the local taxpayers there millions of dollars to replace these now compromised election machines. Now, some in Harrisburg continue their attack by issuing subpoenas for the private, personal information of 9 million Pennsylvania voters. They want your social security number and your driver's license number and personal information about each and every one of you in this room and watching on the live stream. We cannot stand for this political stunt, putting people's information at risk, putting their state constitutional right to privacy at risk, and further sowing doubt in our elections. So we went to court to stop them. Look, we have seen time and time again that opponents of democracy, well, they have nothing to support their bogus claims. Not only does their conduct put your constitutionally protected privacy rights at risk, it's doing real damage to our democracy. Pennsylvania, you should know, has already had two legally required audits. And here's what those two audits found. That we had a free and fair, safe and secure election. That there was no widespread voter fraud. In fact, there were less than a handful of cases, and in each one, the person was trying to cast an extra vote for the former president. Those audits showed that we counted every single legal eligible vote and that what's behind people and, and people behind this effort, people pushing this stunt, really are doing it for one reason, because they want their power to count more than your vote. That's why they're doing this. These legislators who are pushing these false claims, who have signed on to subpoenas for your private personal information, they need to put the law, they need to put their oath of office, our state constitution, and the security of Pennsylvanians before their bogus lies about the 2020 election. Their conduct represents nothing more than a selfish political act, one that demonstrates that they are pandering out of a profound personal weakness. We need to take action today, here in Pennsylvania, and especially at the federal level, to give states more power to protect your vote. I know that Congresswoman Scanlon, who spoke earlier, supports this, and apparently so do 50 United States senators. I led a delegation of attorneys general to call on our federal leaders to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and the Freedom to Vote Act. This legislation preserves local control over elections and ensures that trusted officials, Republicans, Democrats, and independents from voters' own communities count every single vote. This legislation also creates standards to ensure that all Americans can safely and freely cast ballots 
that prevents partisan politicians from sabotaging the results of our elections, as many tried to do throughout the 2020 election continuing today. These laws will help prevent similar attempts to derail our election process in the future and enable the voters' will to be heard. Perhaps, instead of pledging allegiance to the filibuster, the United States Senate should pledge to the American people that they will protect their right to vote. Look, it's not just in D.C. where we need action, though. Here in Pennsylvania, we have to dedicate ourselves to doing our work, to expanding and protecting voting rights right here at home, to making sure that vote by mail, which millions took advantage of in the midst of a pandemic, to participate in our democracy last year, we must protect vote by mail. And I think we need to expand voter access and do things like same-day voter registration in Pennsylvania and automatic voter registration in Pennsylvania, and much, much more. We have a unique responsibility here in the Commonwealth. Pennsylvania, we set an example. Our Commonwealth is the birthplace of our republic. And time and time again, people across the world look to us, to what was born here as a shining example of what democracy can achieve. We have a special responsibility to continue that work. Here at the National Constitution Center, sitting across from Independence Hall, we have a modern reminder that while we, our democracy and our Constitution are steeped in history, they aren't antique or remote. Our democracy is both our heritage and our future. And we need to work together to shore it up. My faith teaches me that we have an obligation to try and repair the world, that no one is required to complete the task, but neither are we free to refrain from it. That means that each of us has a responsibility to do our part. And when it comes to defending our democracy, to protecting and expanding voting rights, each and every one of us as a responsibility to get off the sidelines, to get in the game, and to do our part. The story of American history, which you can see on the walls in this fine institution here, is that each generation of Americans has stepped up to do a little bit better than the generation before them, to protect our democracy when it's been tested. The sacrifice of our ancestors has given us the prosperity and freedom that we work on to this day. And it is our responsibility to protect the government of the people and for the next generation. It is our duty. I am incredibly thankful to the committed partners who've assembled us here today, who do the work not just today, but each and every day in our calendar to build an inclusive society to build a community that respects all and that ensures all can participate in our future. We, of course, gather here today to mark this dark day in our history, but also to dedicate ourselves to the work to ensuring that it never happens again. I want you to know, as your Attorney General, I will continue to do everything in my power to defend our democracy in court and throughout our democratic institutions. I want to thank you for having me here today. And most importantly, I want to thank you for the important work that you're all doing. Thank you. God bless.